All right, let's get started. Today, we're gonna talk about a new dynasty, um, which is called a Ming Dynasty uh, from uh, 1368 to 1644, uh, the Ming Dynasty. And we're also gonna be talking about uh, the early modern era, uh, the early modern era of China. Um, last time we talked about the, uh, the Mongol Dynasty. Uh, which is called the Yuan Dynasty, uh, with the with the capital in Beijing. Uh, the Mongols ruled China for almost 100 years uh, until uh, they got kicked out by Han Chinese uh, around the 1368. Uh, the Yuan um, government uh, did a lot of uh, made a lot of mis many mistakes uh, towards the end of their dynasty uh, for their rule to be ended. Uh, for example, they mobilized a lot of uh, uh, labor to uh, to construct the dikes along the Yellow River. You know, the Yellow River always floods, right? Oh, there's always a major flood once uh, about 100 years. So does any central government that controls the central plain uh, must mobilize a lot of laborers to, uh, to work on uh, the river, to build dikes, uh, to uh, to 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 uh, construct irrigation projects, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the Yuan mobilized a lot of the lab Chinese laborers to um, uh, to work on the river, uh, but it also caused a lot of a uh, uh, dissatisfaction with with the government. Uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing is 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 the um, um, natural disasters uh, that really beset. Uh, China uh, during the time period. So this has to do with some climate uh, climate changes. Um, so drought, floods all together caused famine, and this also caused uh, famine will also cause um, bandits. And then when bandits grow, they become major rebellions uh, that could uh, uh, that could uh, overturn local governments and even threaten uh, the central government. So all these things are working together. Um, the other thing I wanna mention about how a Chinese dynasty end is physical stress. Yeah, so any government is just like any economic entity. Uh, it's faced with financial uh, planning, uh, financial expenditures. All these things are, are crucial to any to any government, right? So traditional Chinese and imperial governments are not an exception. Uh, as we mentioned before, one thing we, one pattern, one financial pattern that we can identify of traditional Chinese dynasties is that uh, the expenditures always grow exponentially as time goes. So if you look at the, the size of government, for every dynasty or empire at, at its beginning stage, it's normally pretty small. It's normally pretty small, normally very efficient. Uh, the relationship between the, the ruler and his, and his ministers are pretty intimate, pretty close. Uh, they, work, they work together pretty well. Uh, but as time goes, you know, as more affairs coming up, like, you know, national defense affairs, right? Uh, Yellow River, uh, natural disaster affairs, education, construction, fiscal affairs, all when all these affairs come up, imperial government tends to build up more offices to solve those problems. And they tend to hire more scholar officials to solve those problems. But then the, pro <laughs> the problem is the more problem you try to solve, <laughs> the more problems are coming. Uh, in the end, it's just like, a, you know, we call this bureaucratic uh, expansion, right? So as time goes, in the end, while new offices, new positions are created, those offices and positions will persist or last forever. Because people always, I mean, as a ruler or boss, you always love to hire people. It's always difficult to fire people because, you know, that, that, that affects um, your employees' benefits, right? So as time goes, the, the size of government will continue to grow to the degree that 
it become a huge physical burden for the empire, right? Uh, almost all Chinese dynasties repeat this kind of financial pattern. For example, the Ming Dynasty we're going to talk about at its beginning decades, it's you know during the first decades of its time, uh, the size of government is only hundreds of scholars, scholar officials, hundreds of officials, good enough, sufficient to run the whole empire. But about 300 years later, uh, towards the end of the empire, you, you, you got more than 100,000 officials. But the problem is, the problem is your revenue remains the same, okay? So when you have a larger expanding government, but your revenue also grows at the same time, but not at the same speed as, as government growth, then you got a problem, then you got a problem, okay? So the problem is the pay to each official is getting less and less. So when you have, we, we're gonna talk about this in details, but one problem with the China's modern, early modern era is that with the population, I mean, the population of China is growing rapidly uh, during the, uh, uh, the 16th, 17th century. But the size of the government, although it's growing, but the local government size is not growing in proportion to Chinese population. And the result is, is the government become less and less efficient, less and less efficient. So the society got into a, a lot of problems. So this, this, this is the major problem. Okay, back to the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty actually made a lot of mistakes. For example, they learned how to issue paper bill from the Song Dynasty. Uh, and the, and the, the mistake they made is that they, they, they created inflation. They, they, they issued too much paper bills without enough uh, reserve uh, in their central bank. So people realize that the, the paper bill, the issue is just garbage. So no one is using it. No one is using it. Uh, people go to the uh, uh, to a precious metal as the major currency uh, privately. So the government's credibility or the government credit is collapsing, right? So this again, so all these factors coming together are so causing a lot of a Rebe rebellions. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the Warren rebels. So we're, this this guy is called Zhu Yuanzhang. Um, Zhu Yuanzhang, the founder of the new dynasty, Ming Dynasty, he is born into a very very poor family. I, I think I think among all the Chinese emperors, this guy is probably from the poorest family. Absolutely the poorest family. His uh, Zhu Yuanzhang's father and grandfather they did not, they did not even have a name. They're they're, they're called by like the ranking in the family. His father is called like, a, uh, his grandfather was called like a Jew uh, 54. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's not a, even a real name. Yeah, Jew 54, yeah. It just, just means he's number 54 in, in the whole clan or whole extended family. And, and Zhu Yanzhao, when, when he was young, his siblings are, uh, some of his siblings even starved to death because of the famine. He, he was born in Southern Central Plain and today is a sort of a Northern Anhui province. Yeah, uh, so he growing up in poverty. Uh, his family was so poor that his his parents couldn't afford uh, the the financial burden of raising him up. He was sent to a Buddhist monastery. Okay, to to so he served as as a Buddhist monk uh, for for a certain time period. So this guy have seen all the all the terrible conditions of the lowest, lowest strata of the Chinese society. Yeah, he has seen that, he has seen that. But all this terrible experience of poverty, violence, and, and, and harsh life did not make him a very kind person, okay? He's not a very kind person. I mean, growing out of that kind of poverty and violence give him this mentality that he has to be strong. Okay, he he grow his gr growing up in the belief with the belief that he has to be very very strong willed, very very harsh, sometimes very very cruel, uh, ready to kill anyone in his way. So when he's growing up, uh, his his when he's rising up as a rebel leader, he he joined several the rebellion groups and eventually became a a, a successful military uh, commander. Uh, and his army eventually defeated the, the Mongol army. The Mongols, although they, they were really good at fighting uh, during the 13th century, 
But after 100 years, you know, when they enjoyed all the political privileges in China, uh, they sort of degenerated. Uh, they, they, they are not anymore. They are no longer good fighters anymore, right? You know, all the Mongols, uh, they're, 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 they're ruling class everywhere in China, okay? They, 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 they scattered all around China, in Yunnan province, many other provinces. And everywhere they go, uh, they're rulers. Uh, they they have a lots of last time we talked about this uh, this like a social caste system uh, that was in place under the Yuan dynasty. So the Mongols really uh, did not have to work, uh, did not have to uh, serve military, you know, did not have to do a lot of a military service services. So so after one hundred years, they forgot how to how to how to ride a horse or 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 how to how to how to use bows and arrows. So they lost the kind of military spirit that their ancestors had. So yeah, so in 14th century, they, uh, uh, they were defeated by these uh, Chinese rebels like, like Zhu Yuanzhang. So in 16, uh, I'm sorry, 1368, uh, Zhu Yuanzhang uh, and his army, he sent his army uh, to defeat most of his rival rebel uh, competitors. And then he also sent army to attack Beijing, uh, the Yuan Dynasty capital. Actually, uh, Beijing became the capital since the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, and, and, and Beijing has been China's capital through the following two dynasties, including Ming uh, and Qing, except for a certain short time period when the capital was in Nanjing, the southern capital. All right, so um, these are the portraits of our founding emperor. Okay, as you can see, he probably suffered some uh, smallpox, right? Look at the, all these dots <laughs> on his face. So he, uh, he, he, he was infected with the yeah, smallpox. So he, he's not the, let's say he's not the most uh, best, he's not the best looking man, okay, uh, in, 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 in the world. But, but he loves people to, he loves to hire uh, painters to, to, to make portraits for him. Yeah, legend has it that he's so cruel that if a painter would uh, uh, faithfully, accurately depict his look or his face, yeah, he, 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 the, the painter will be slaughtered. Uh, so, so he's just cruel like that uh, until, until he finally got a satisfactory uh, portrait like this, you know, where he is depicted as a kind and of nice and a wise old man, okay? Although he has actually pretty ugly, you know, that's, that's what, uh, what the historical sources report. Yeah, he, he has a really sticking chain, as you can see from those, from those uh, uh, portraits, yeah. Uh, but he's the emperor, okay, he's the emperor. Um, when he's in power, he launched several purges. Um, we're gonna talk about this. Um, purges means a political movement, a ruler try to sort of, uh, uh, kick out his people he did not like in the offices. Okay, we, we call this purges, purges, right? For example, Joseph Stalin launched many purges, right? Mao, Chairman Mao also launched many purges uh, during the Cultural Revolution period uh, from 1966 to, to 1976, right? Zhu Yuanzhang did the same thing, right? Uh, he, he did not want to share power with his, uh, uh, his uh, friends who followed him in the Civil War. Uh, that got him the, the throne. Uh, so he launched at least three or four major purchases each time he killed um, 20 to 30,000 people uh, in, his, in his government, uh, in his government. So, so this guy is not afraid to kill a lot of people, to kill a lot of people. So if you look at the Chinese politics, truly cruelty, violence, brutality, those are the words to describe that kind of a palace politics, okay? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty high risk, uh, pretty dangerous. Yeah, pretty dangerous. But by by killing so many people, he 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 consolidated his rule. Okay, he consolidated his rule. Um, you know, later historians compared Zhu Yuanzhang with the Mao Zedong because both of them share uh, a lot of uh, in common. Uh, they share a lot of in common. Uh, they're from sort of a, uh, from countryside. Uh, they don't have any nobility. A background, uh, they rose to power through military, through the successful use of military power, right? They're rebels, they're rebels that overturned uh, the previous government. And then after they're in power, they, they use iron-fisted policies to consolidate their rule. Uh, they're not afraid 
uh, they don't shy away from killing a lot of their colleagues. Yeah, sometimes hundreds, thousands of them. Okay, so but by doing that, uh, they try they sort of consolidated their rule pretty successfully. Uh, and, and both of both Zhu Yanzhang and Mao also had this uh, sort of a populist tendency. This is my point of view. That means they, although they were really harsh on government officials, but they sort of try to sort of uh, rely on rely their rule on Chinese peasants. They have this confidence in Chinese rural society. They believe that a rural society or Chinese peasants should be the mainstay of their rule or their revolution. I mean, in Mao's case, that's revolution. We're gonna talk about this later. So Mao, although he claims that he's a Marxist, right, he's a communist, but truly Mao's rule is deeply rooted in Chinese tradition. Mao is very, very familiar with the Chinese legalist tradition that we talked about several lectures back. Mao is very, Mao even admires some of the, um, uh, the, the policies and actions of previous emperors have done like a Julian and John. So, so to understand China's, today's China, we really need to look at China's history, okay? To have a deeper understanding of that, okay? Uh, so the Mongols got kicked out. Uh, the funny thing is that, uh, let me show you a map maybe. The Mongols, um, the Mongol Yuan Dynasty in Beijing, okay, it's outside of this map. Um, the Mongol Yuan Dynasty in Beijing, over here, in 1368, when Zhu Yanzhang's army was, uh, was about to attack the city, Beijing, uh, the last Yuan Emperor gave up. He did not even fight. He just opened up the, the, the northern gate of the city and they fled to Mongolia. They fled to Mongolia. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all Mongols are gone because for, for, for the 100 years uh, when Mongols were in China, they intermarried with a lot of Chinese. And so this is why um, uh, almost all Chinese perhaps have some Mongol blood. Yeah. Uh, so, so the Ming Dynasty sort of unified China, restored Han Chinese rule uh, in 1368. Okay. Uh, but the Mongols remain in Mongolia because the Chinese is always very difficult for the Han Chinese to destroy all the Mongols uh, outside of the Great Wall. So, the, so all the Ming done, everything that the Ming government can do is to continue to build the Great Wall of China. Okay, so whenever the, the central government is not a, established by nomadic people, if it's established by Han Chinese, like a Ming dynasty, then you're gonna have to build the, 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 uh, the Great Wall of China to defend uh, the agricultural part of China against the nomadic peoples. The Mongols are always there and they constantly pose a threat to the Ming, to the Ming dynasty. Okay, so next we're gonna move on to another emperor, Zhu uh, Di. Um, Zhu Di is Zhu Yanzhang's son, but he was not the throne prince, uh, but he was very able. He, he certainly has a military genius. He was appointed by his father, to serve in Beijing city, uh, in, the, in the Beijing city. So he is the military commander in, in, the, in the garrison, in the main garrison in Beijing to defend the empire against the Mongols. Um, but he did not get along with his nephew who inherited uh, the, the throne. Uh, so eventually he launched a rebellion and, and he, he, he defeated his nephew's army. Uh, and he, he, he took uh, Nanjing, the Southern capital, uh, which is a city where I was born. Um, and then after that, his nephew sort of got missing. Uh, it was, he, he's gone missing in, in the last battle. And the, and, and the Imperial Palace in, in the Southern capital got burned down. Uh, so no, no one knows where, where the, the previous emperor uh, went. So Judy became the emperor, uh, became the emperor, but he did not, did not get the throne through a sort of a justifiable, legitimate uh, approach. So he desperately wanted to have the recognition of his legitimacy by everyone under heaven, uh, not just people in China under his rule, but also foreigners, say people in Southeast Asia, people in, 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 in Indonesia, in Philippines, right? Uh, people even in, in, in India and, and Africa. He, he wanted 
everyone in in the world to recognize his uh, his power and his uh, legitimacy. You know, when you when you when you're really missing something, you normally desperately want it, right? Because that's the mentality of our our Emperor Judy. So for that reason, Judy launched Judy launched seven voyages. Uh, he built up a huge fleet to visit all these different areas, regions of the world to sort of a proclaim his power, to show off his wealth and, and to declare his legitimacy. So that's what he wanted to do. So we're gonna talk about um, the emperor's seven voyages to the world, okay? Um, the, the admiral he appointed, the emperor appointed is someone called Zheng He, okay? His name is here, yeah, Zheng He. Zheng He, his ancestors were not Han Chinese. Zheng He's ancestors were from Central Asia. He probably has a lot of uh, Arabian blood. His father and grandfather visited the Mecca, um, is showing that they're, they're both Muslims. So Zheng He is a Muslim, okay, is a Muslim. But he, as a, as a Central Asian uh, family, uh, Zheng He's family migrated to, to, to China uh, during the Yuan Dynasty, and they uh, they served the Yuan government in southern China, uh, in Yunnan Province. Yunnan Province of China is very is close to uh, to Burma, uh, in, in in the south. Uh, so when Zhu Yuanzhao's army attacked uh, Yunnan Province, uh, Zheng He, uh, a young boy, was um, arrested. Uh, Zhu Yuanzhang followed the Mongols' tradition. You know, he, he treated the POWs, prisoners of war, very brutally. So as a young boy, Zheng He was castrated uh, against his will, against his will. So he's taken as a slave. Uh, and then young Zheng He was given to Zhu Di, uh, one of the prince, princes, right? Zhu Di, the prince, uh, he, 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 he was given uh, the young Zheng He as a slave. So he took Zheng He to Beijing and they, uh, they sort of grew up together and they built up a very strong friendship. Uh, Judy really trusted this eunuch. Uh, Zheng He is a eunuch. Uh, so when Judy became emperor, he gave the job of organizing the seven voyages to, uh, to, his, to the eunuch he, he trusted, that is Zheng He. So this is how the eunuch became uh, the, the animal, uh, became the animal that leads the seven uh, voyages to visit uh, the so-called uh, Western Oceans. West Chinese call it the Xiang, uh, Western Oceans. So the first voyage, uh, the first several voyages set out from the Southern capital in from Nanjing, and they're gonna visit, they, they're gonna sail all the way through China's east coast to South China Sea, okay, here, South China Sea. And then they would, uh, they would uh, visit Vietnam. At that time, there are different kingdoms in Vietnam. Uh, they, uh, uh, Zheng He dealt with the local rulers in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then they would uh, also visit uh, different uh, tribal, uh, tribal entities, uh, tribal leaders in Indonesia, okay. They would also visit uh, today's uh, Malaya, uh, Cambodia, right? And then they would sail south to today's Singapore. Uh, there's a strait there called the Maluka Strait. And they would cross the Maluka Strait. This would allow them to enter the Indian Ocean. And then they would cross the Indian Ocean and uh, visit today's Sri Lanka, uh, which is called Shilan uh, in, in history. Uh, and then from there, they would uh, visit these different Indian uh, cities. Uh, at that time, there, there are many different kingdoms in India. So it depends on who you, depending on who you, uh, who you deal with, uh, you're gonna have to trade, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna trade with them, right? And Zheng He's subfleets also visited, visited um, uh, the Persian Gulf uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, they crossed uh, they crossed this uh, uh, this uh, this ocean and they visit all these uh, cities uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and there is you know some of the some of the sub sub fleets even visited the Red Sea. Uh, they, they they sailed all the way into Red Sea. The Chinese 
yeah, went that far. And some of them even visited uh, East Africa, including Kenya, uh, Somalia, right? All these cities, all these, all these regions, okay? So the purpose of these voyages is to show off the emperor's power, wealth, uh, and uh, and uh, sort of a hospitality, right? Because all these local kings and leaders, they're invited to visit China. So if you wanna, if you wanna say, uh, look at the Chinese capital, uh, Zheng He would be very welcome. And he say, hey, jump on, just just jump in my, jump in my ship. Uh, I will bring you to China, and uh, and they would bring all these local leader, uh, local tribal leaders or kings from from Philippines, from Indonesia, from Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and the the emperor would welcome them uh, in their in their capital, and some of the local uh, tribal leaders and kings even stayed in China for more than ten years, and, and they died there. Uh, they died there, so they enjoy uh, the Chinese civilization over there. Zheng He's fleet is also very impressive. Uh, there, there are conflicting information about how large his fleet is, but but historians generally agree that for every for every voyage, the hundreds, hundreds of ships. The largest ships are called treasure ships, called a bao chuan in Chinese. Uh, they're huge. They are the, probably the largest wooden boats or ships ever built by any human beings. You know, uh, uh, historical reports uh, range from about the size. They range from I don't, I don't know, one hundred feet long to maybe three hundred feet long. Three hundred feet long, maybe a little too. Uh, too much is probably a, a, an imagination, but uh, certainly those uh, those uh, treasure ships are are are, are, are the largest uh, ever uh, hu any human can build uh, with with wood. Um, and and uh, so they're, they're moving cities. They're moving cities. And 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 in addition to the biggest treasure ships, there are another uh, hundreds of smaller ships, uh, like horse ships, water tank ships, uh, uh, repair ships, uh, and, and battleships. Uh, each battleship would uh, would be equipped with with dozens of uh, of bronze cannon guns, so the biggest navy as well. So when everyone witnessed the movements of such a huge fleet, it's awe inspiring. It's absolutely awe inspiring, and that's exactly what the emperor wanted people to to think of. Uh, to, to to that's exactly the the mental reaction the, the emperor wants. He wants to impress all these all these uh, China's neighbors, right? Uh, so these are moving cities, uh, consisting of uh, each voyage would have consist uh, of more than twenty thousand soldiers uh, se uh, and a seamen uh, and a crew members. They each are in, in in charge of different things, and 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 it, and they also bring uh, repair material with them. So that means if any ship got broken, they can fix it immediately uh, and continue to sail. Continue to sail. Um, and, and the Chinese also have very abundant knowledge about uh, about uh, sailing. Uh, for example, they would plant veggies, fruits on, on those huge ships. They even have uh, water pounds uh, to uh, to raise freshwater fish so that they have fish to eat. Yeah, so, so uh, veggies and uh, fresh veggies and fruits are super important for this long distance sailing. Because you know when Europeans embarked on embarked on journeys to explore uh, different parts of the world through maritime routes, a lot of them suffer from the problem of lack of vitamin, and that's deadly. A lot of Europeans died uh, during uh, during I mean eighty or one hundred years later uh, for lack of vitamin. But but Chinese never had that problem. <laughs> they, because their ships are moving cities where they can they can grow veggies and fruits. And and provide a vitamin to their crew members, so that's not a problem, uh, not a problem. So we can do a comparison of of uh, Zheng He's voyages and say, um, Christopher Columbus, Columbus is uh, Santa Maria. Okay, so if you look at this this comparison, there's a tiny small ship, is Columbus, Columbus is Santa Maria, yeah, seventy five feet by twenty five feet, a small boat. And in the background is Zheng He's treasure boat. Treasure boat. That's that's how large that boat is. Okay, the Chinese really built up the largest navy. And and Zheng He is eighty years.
before, 80 years before, before Da Gama, uh, the, the Portuguese uh, uh, sailor uh, who, who arrived in India. When Zheng He arrived in India, uh, they, they, the, the Chinese were reported by the local people as so-called the white man. So, so this shows something interesting. The, the racial concepts that we have today is a modern invention. Ancient people, when they look at other people's skin, they don't have our modern understanding, a European honors, you know, categorization of a, uh, of a racial uh, categories. So, so Chinese could be considered as, as white men by local Indians, because as most in Southern India, we know that the most uh, local population, they have darker skin. So, so when they see Chinese, they think that these people are white men. But, but Zheng He was there 80 years earlier than, than, than Europeans who arrived in India. Uh, but the Chinese are very different from, from the Europeans. Um, we know that we're talking about an era of colonization, right? Yeah, the great era of exploration when, when Europeans wanted to find the colonies. Europeans visited all these different regions of the world to establish colonies, okay? They want to find supplier of the raw material and they want to find the markets for their European products, right? This is what we call cl colonialism, but the Chinese are different. Zheng He, I mean, they, they might be, uh, the, the Chinese may be motivated by a pompous motivation. The emperor just want to show his power, but the Chinese had no intention to establish any colonies, no matter where they go. Although they had the power, they had the military power. I mean, look at how large the, the Navy is. They had the power to establish colonies in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, India, and even East Africa, but they didn't. They just basically, they, they came over to say hello and to show you how wealthy and powerful we are and they traded with the local people and they bring the local exotic products back to their capital. That's it. They never established any colonies. They did not even build up any military bases uh, along the way, although they could. So, so very. So keep in mind that these Chinese voyages are very, very different from from the European uh, from the European voyages. Okay. Um, so when when Zheng He visited Africa, uh, they brought over all these exotic animals uh, like rhino, hippo, yeah, uh, lions, right, the cheetah. Uh, and and, Zheng, and one day Zheng He reported that reported to the emperor. He said, "Hey, emperor, your Majesty, we we, we found the legendary beast mentioned in the Analects of Confucius. In the Analects Confucius, there is one passage that says uh, Confucius dreamed of a unicorn, and when he wakes up, Confucius says, "I'm going to die because I dreams of uh, this legendary beast that has a unicorn." Uh, but but no one sees. No Chinese have ever seen a unicorn, right? It's a legendary beast. But Zheng He reports that we caught a unicorn in Africa. And the emperor, we, we're gonna, your majesty, we're gonna bring some, at least two of them back to you. The emperor is super happy. Uh, and, and the emperor built up a zoo, to a royal zoo to accommodate all these exotic animals that Zheng He brought over. And sure enough, here's the unicorn. This is the unicorn that Zheng He brought to the emperor. In order to welcome the unicorn into the royal zoo, the emperor had to demolish and enlarge the city gate because the unicorn, these unicorns are too tall. <laughs> they, they even had to uh, enlarge the city gate for the unicorns to come in. Uh, so yeah, so that's, um, so the emperor is super happy with all these, uh, all these um, um, contributions to his personal collection of exotic plants and animals. Uh, the Chinese also accumulated a lot of knowledge about uh, the world uh, through these voyages. Yeah, they, so what's shown in the PowerPoint is a nautical chart, uh, is, is the sea map that, 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 that the, Chinese, the Zheng He uh, sort of uh, uh, made. Uh, the Chinese has, has, has their own technologies to, uh, to, to measure the distance, to measure the depth of the sea, to measure directions, and, 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 to, and to chart the territories, the, the oceans they, uh, they explored. Uh, so all this all these knowledge 
uh, is is contained in in all these ch nautical charts. Uh, but unfortunately, um, after Judy Emperor Judy died, uh, these voyages uh, were ended because the uh, Confucian scholars believe that these voyages, although they may be fun, uh, the emperor have, is having a lot of fun with those voyages, but they're too ex expensive. They're way too expensive. Well, think about that. I mean, for any country to, to send it, to organize seven voyages containing hundreds of huge ships with 20,000 uh, uh, crew members, that, that's gonna cost you a lot of money. So eventually uh, Confucian scholars are uh, criticized. Uh, they, 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 I mean, they criticized the, these voyages. Um, uh, Confucian scholars are saying, you know, we, we can use the money in better ways, right? You, you, can, you, can, you can perhaps, you know, uh, to 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 uh, compensate the farmers who suffer famine, right? Or maybe even to build up more schools, right? We can we can do we can do lots of things with that money. You don't you don't have to you know just waste that money into those uh, useless voyages. So in the end, uh, these voyages were all ended, and uh, some Confucian scholar officials they're afraid that future emperors would uh, reorganize uh, this kind of voyages, so they burned down. The nautical charts like this, the, just the, the, the ocean maps made by, by Zheng He, most of them uh, were destroyed. Uh, what, what you see on the screen is only a tiny, small portion of Zheng He's nautical charts uh, that are left. Yeah, so, 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 so in the imperial court, you will see different discourses, different opinions competing with each other, right? competing with each other. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, these uh, these are peaceful voyages. So these these voyages are mainly very peaceful, except for for like two of these voyages, in which Zheng He destroyed some pirates. Then in uh, in Indonesia, yeah, in Indonesia uh, there was a, a major Chinese pirates um, who were who, whose uh, whose uh, army uh, navy uh, were destroyed by Zheng He. That, that's one that's one battle that Zheng He engaged in. And the, uh, the only other battle is, is in Sri Lanka or Xilan. Uh, Chinese sources reported that when Zheng He arrived at Xilan, they tried to establish some kind of diplomatic relations with the, with, with the Xilan king. Uh, but the king felt threatened. Because when you, when you see when you see hundreds of <laughs> ships coming to your harbor, to your city. Uh, with the twenty thousand well-trained, well-equipped soldiers, uh, you you feel threatened, right? So the Chinese sources report that um, the Xilan king invited Zheng He to a banquet, but in the banquet uh, they actually wanted to kill Zheng He. But Zheng He realizes this, okay? So he, Zheng He secretly sends uh, an army to attack to attack the the Xilan uh, army. At the same time, when he goes to uh, the banquet. Uh, the Chinese uh, military force easily defeated uh, the local Xilan army. And then, um, so the Chinese controlled uh, the country, uh, or at least the capital. And what Zheng He did is that they, 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 they arrested uh, the, the Xilan king who tried to kill him. And they brought the Xilan king all the way back to China as a prisoner, as a prisoner, okay, to Nanjing, uh, the southern capital. And Judy, the emperor, interrogated uh, the Xilan king. Uh, the emperor <laughs> asked the Xilan king, why would you do this to me? Or something like that. Um, and, and the Xilan king was, uh, was under arrest in China for, for many years. And then, and, and then the Chinese also established a pro-Chinese government in Xilan, who is the, the previous king's younger brother. Okay, so this kind of a world of policing activities, I, I call them world of policing activities. Uh, very similar to what United States are doing today. When it's, you know, the United States is sort of a, you know, motivated by this uh, uh, belief in legitimacy based on democracy. United States sometimes will go to militarily intervene in other countries' politics, right? Overturn the government and then establish the pro American government. The Chinese did the same thing. The Chinese did the same thing, okay, in, in Sri Lanka. Um, so this is a very controversial, okay? Very controversial. Uh, but for a for for this time period, China served as the world police. 
So Zheng He's voyages also served the job of policing all these neighboring countries. For example, uh, for those Southeast Asian countries like Burma or Thailand, if one country wants to pay a tribute to China's capital, but if the if the um, uh, if the envoy is thwarted or stopped by by his neighbor country, then 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 you could you could file a complaint with Beijing uh, or or Nanjing. I mean, in this case, I mean, uh, Zhu Di first had his capital in Nanjing, and then he relocated the capital to Beijing. So if the Chinese camper receive that complaint, he would uh, he would send a letter to. The, the other party in the dispute saying, hey, you're sort of uh, violating this international law that China recognizes, okay? Uh, yeah, because you cannot stop your neighbor from uh, paying a tribute to Beijing, right? Or if a Southeast Asian country had a coup d'etat, that means had, had, a, had a sort of a, a inner, inner struggle. For example, if a minister overturned the previous king's rule and usurped the throne. In that case, uh, the Ch Chinese emperor would also intervene. So the so Chinese concept of, of, of a in a proper international order certainly is not based on democracy. Uh, there is no such a thing, uh, but it's based on conservative traditional legitimacy. Right? For example, if if the Thailand king, the Thai king has been ruling for 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 like centuries, but all of a sudden. Uh, a, a, a evil minister is going to usurp the throne. Then, then the Chinese king, a uh, Chinese emperor, would intervene by by sending first sending a letter. If uh, if there's no response, then he would send the navy. He would send navy to Southeast Asia. Okay, because in the eyes of the Chinese emperor, there's only one son of heaven. Okay, all the other local leaders are just local kings. They are they are protectorates. Yeah, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, or all these different the tribes in Philippines, they're all just they're just protectorates. Okay. The, the, they, they, they're required to sort of pay tribute to, to, to Chinese capital. Um, and, and, the, and the emperor also is required to provide military uh, assistance to these local regimes. So it's a mutual sort of obligation. It's a mutual obligation. Uh, another example. Of this tribute system is is that uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, in in late 16th century, in the 1590s, uh, still China was still under the Ming Dynasty rule. The Japanese invaded Korea. Uh, Japanese invaded Korea. There's a Japanese um, a Japanese military leader uh, Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi. Uh, Invaded Chosun Dynasty in Korea. Yeah, Korea was ruled by this dynasty called Chosun Dynasty. The Chosun King uh, was sort of a a, 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 a considered himself as as sort of a, a a protectorate of Beijing. So he sent he he you know the Korean King always paid tribute to Beijing periodically, uh, very diligently. So as 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 a return, he wanted military assistance from Beijing when when Korea was under attack. By, by Japan. So the, the Ming emperor sent a large army to Korea to help with the, with the Chosun king. Uh, and, and the Chinese fought with the, with the Japanese for, 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 for many years in Korea, in Korea you, until, until Hideyoshi died and the Japanese had to retreat. So that's the story. So, so in other words, the, the emperor is obligated to sort of to, to provide some kind of military help to his protectorates. Okay, back to uh, Zheng He's voyages. Um, there, there are different interpretations, different interpretations of this, of these voyages. One, one opinion is that these voyages are pretty good, right? Uh, because, I mean, this is modern scholars' opinion. The, we call it the first opinion. First opinion is that the, these voyages are good because Chinese are not seeking to Establish any colonies. Uh, they are basically peaceful and friendly. They traded with the local people. Uh, they they sign up. A, they sign up a sort of a. Uh, they not sign treaties, but they but they but they establish a lot of stone steles or or, or in stone inscriptions everywhere they go, uh, to sort of strengthen the friendship and diplomacy with the local governments, right? 
it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But the second opinion is that um, is a Confucian opinion. That means uh, that means uh, these uh, these voyages are totally a waste of resources. Third opinion is that also a modern op opinion. That is, China missed the opportunity. China missed opportunity to build up a colonial empire like the European state. Okay, yeah, this is this this opinion was held by modern Chinese scholars, especially in early 20th century. Uh, yeah, so the, the this opinion is that China could have, you know, just like Europeans who arrived in India and Africa 80 years later, China could have built up a a lot of colonies. Uh, in in those countries, so that they could uh, they could uh, use the market and, and the raw material uh, in those colonies to sort of uh, uh, help with a industrial revolution uh, in China per se uh, in China uh, the homeland right we know that you know industrial revolution could not have happened in West Europe uh, in the uh, in the late 18th century and early 19th century without colonies right. Because when you have an industrial revolution, you're gonna build a build a lot of textiles, right? Machines, right? a lot of products, industrial products. Without a market, who are you gonna sell it to, right? You're gonna to have to sell your products uh, to the vast market in your colonies. This is how Britain uh, rose in history, uh, successful in industrial revolution, right? Colonies are very important. Um, but look at China. China did not have industrial revolution, uh, right? In early modern period, China sort of a, China has been taking the lead uh, as as a leading civilization. But in this time period, we're talking about China is falling behind, right? So this is a third opinion is, is saying uh, Zheng He's voyages could have built up all these colonies and 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 and, and boosting China's own industrial revolution, but it didn't. It's a missed opportunity. So I wanna I wanna hear what you think about this. So among these three opinions, which one do you think makes sense, uh, and why? Anyone? Honestly, I think all three of them make sense within the context. Like I um. I don't think there's an issue necessarily with any of them because I know at that time like imperialism and colonialism was like a really big thing that people were trying to spread um and it was like rapidly happening even yeah. like within 80 years it's not a very long time frame to have like like to colonize the entire world so it makes sense that a lot of people would have seen it as a missed opportunity but at the same time I think it is a good thing that they were kind of just looking around and not necessarily trying to mess with any countries mm -hmm. so I think all three of them have really ground like solid grounds for a good argument hmm. interesting so they are all right huh yeah i would say because all of them fit within the context of where the empire was going and everything good very good uh any other comments do you guys agree with the jay lee yeah i, I would say i agree as well but i think that what's kind of hard about this is that a lot of this can be influenced by hindsight like obviously we as people living centuries after the fact can think about how China missed an opportunity to establish a colonial empire or consider the merits of this naval fleet but obviously the, the people at this time couldn't predict any of those things I mean when you look at a because as we read, I mean, for our readings, the Ming dynasty like very quickly went through some financial problems yes. later in its reign, which did not help things. And we can't be certain whether this naval fleet would have been a bigger detriment had they continued it, like whether that would have just ended up using up even more money and facilitated the collapse faster or if perhaps if China did try to use, like use it to establish colonial empires, if it could have prolonged the lifespan of the Ming dynasty by mm -hmm. giving it access to more resources, like what happened with all of these European empires. Right. I mean, I think 
I think China, even if they had the opportunity to establish a colonial empire, I think China was at this point generally just more content with having countries pay tribute, right? Like because of the belief that you know the emperor was like this kind of moral center of this region and that right. it was only respectful to pay tribute to him. I don't think they were really expecting much more from these countries than that. But again, that's something with like the benefit of hindsight. We can say, oh, they missed out because yeah. because we know that the European countries were doing that, but China didn't necessarily know that these European empires were going to become so powerful. So they might have yeah not thought it was necessary and just thought, hey, this is wasting money. We're already going through some financial difficulties. So I think I think they're all, yeah, I would agree that they're all understandable, but it's also a matter of like, I imagine it was very difficult uh, deciding what exactly to do for the people in that time. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, totally, totally. That's, those are good points. Yeah, any other comments? Yeah, those are great discussion. I think it's also important to understand that a nation's responsibility is first and foremost to its own territories and to its own people. Mm -hmm. So if you are having problems domestically, it's generally unwise to invest so much in international mm -hmm. colonization so, or trade. So Maria, do, do you agree with the Confucian scholars who, who uh, criticize these expensive voyages more? I would because there is still like a struggling class there's still like a lot of poverty, a lack of education. Exactly. Like, I think all of that money could have definitely gone into the institutions within that country instead of trying to create more institutions outside of the country. Good. Yeah, good point. Good point. Uh, any other comments? Actually, uh, I just thought of another thing as well. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Which is that... Um, I think part of the problem with the idea of China establishing a, a colonial empire in this period is because China is already such a massively populated country at this time. Mm -hmm. And in order to run an effective colonial empire, you need to be able to expend military resources to mm -hmm. keep those colonies. Well, first to establish the colonies in the first place and then to keep them in line. Yeah. And the problem is that China is already so large, both in terms of geographic area and in population, that I'm sure that mm -hmm. it could only cause more instability to take soldiers that could be needed domestically and sending them abroad to oversee colonies. Because countries like you know, Britain or France, I mean, they're not necessarily small countries, but compared to China, they're certainly not big mm -hmm. so they they could afford to send those soldiers off i think china would have been a much more risky maneuver because we already know about the problems with banditry that were occurring i think right that kind of building off and of also what, the mongos right yeah like there were still all these there were still all these like peoples that would raid mm -hmm. in chinese territory so i mean kind of building off of what maria was saying i think that China, it probably could have suffered from domestic problems if it tried to expend those military resources on establishing colonies. Good, good point, good point. Yeah, uh, by the way, as a footnote to what Ryan just said, uh, China never built such a navy, such a large navy after Zheng He's voyages until modern time, until modern time. Yeah, uh, you know, after, after Judy died, Emperor Judy died. The Confucian scholars not only burned down, burned down the nautical charts, they also just let those treasure ships to rot, get rotten in the in the shipyards, in the shipyards. Yeah, because they don't want any future emperors to organize such expensive voyages anymore. So no, no navy. China is turning sort of inwards. Yeah, military expansion happened um, over land, not not overseas anymore. Not overseas anymore. Yeah. If you look at the Qing dynasty, which is the last dynasty of China, which we're going to talk about next time, the Qing expanded militarily towards Central Asia, towards Mongolia, uh, towards Tibet, uh, but not 
towards the sea anymore. So China has been be, be building a, a, a land empire. So uh, not, very, not a very strong interest in the ocean anymore. So this is an exception. So Zhenghe's voyages serve uh, more like an, ex an exception uh, rather than uh, the rule. Uh, but, but these voyages were sort of a reinterpreted in many different ways by later historians, right? We know that it drew in the main scholar officials thought this is wasteful. Uh, this is a, such a waste of resources. And then in modern time, when China was bullied by European powers, right? Uh, many Chinese scholars realized that maybe we missed a chance. So, so in other words, a same, any one historical event would always be reinterpreted in many different ways in history, depending on your contemporary agenda. So as, as you guys rightly pointed out, so all these conclusions or interpretations, they make sense in their own context. Yeah, because a historian's job is to understand uh, before we judge. Um, but you will continue to see this, right? So, so in modern, in, in early 20th century, when China is bullied, uh, defeated by European powers, the missed opportunity interpretation came up, okay? And then in 21st century, when China achieved such economic achievement accomplishments, right, by economic reform, uh, by market economy, um, Xi Jinping's government, I mean, President Xi Jinping is, is, is uh, president of China today. Xi, president Xi Jinping is making a lot of uh, initiatives that reinterprets Zheng He's voyages as historical precedents to justify today's contemporary China's economic expansion or 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 or, or business activities in all these in all these countries. This is called the One Belt One Road Initiative. Yeah, it, if you, if you do a Google search, you will you will know that China over the past ten years, China has been engaging in this called One Belt One Road. Um, uh, one road, one belt uh, initiative. That means China is gonna, it's gonna, uh, China established a, a, a investment bank to loan a lot of money to China's neighbors, including all these Southeast Asian countries, right? Uh, in Southeast, in Southeast Asian countries, uh, in the, in Sri Lanka received a lot of loans from China. And also, uh, basically, they follow the routes, the maritime routes of Zhenghe. For all these countries, China is, is uh, China is, um, uh, the, the, the Asian Developments and Investment Bank uh, headquartered in Beijing is giving loans to all these countries uh, and also including all these uh, uh, China's uh, land, uh, Eurasian neighbors uh, like uh, Kazakhstan, uh, 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 even Russia and Ukraine to uh, extend China's economic influences. Um, so for that reason, Zheng He's voyages are cited by Chinese government as a, a good precedent of a peaceful diplomacy and friendly relationships with all these countries. For example, in 2008, when the Olympic Games uh, were, were hosted, uh, were held in Beijing, Zheng He's voyages uh, were depicted uh, as an opera uh, in, in, in the Olympic Stadium. To show that Chinese are friendly, you know, we're we 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 don't wanna we don't wanna have colonial uh, colonial uh, expansion or, or or colonial control of your country. We just come over to say hello. So, so the same historical events are constantly being reinterpreted by different enactors of history for their own particular political economic agendas, and this will continue to happen. You will see a lot of times you will see totally composing interpretations of any uh, single historical event, right? You, you will find that numerous historical events are like that, like that in, in history. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is, uh, is a one interesting uh, argument that is uh, a retired British naval officer um, uh, authored a book called um, called a 14, I don't, I don't know, I don't remember the exact title. It's probably called a 1430 something, uh, China Dis Chinese Discovered America. Uh, it's, it's authored by a amateur historian, 
uh, called a uh, Mr. Menges, if I my memory serves me right. Uh, so this this retired naval military officer's claims that Zheng He's fleet discovered America before Columbus. Yeah, and and his uh, his evidence is one very vague report from Zheng He's uh, travel log, uh, and, and not not Zheng He's his personal travel log, but his his follow his officers travel log that uh, mentions. Uh, a a lost sub fleet was drifting in the in the Pacific Ocean for like more than forty days, and then eventually they landed in a, in an unknown land. Uh, so, so, Mr. Menges believed that he uh, uh, Zheng He's voice, Zheng He actually uh, found discovered uh, America, and he also uh, he he also discovered so called another piece of evidence that it is a Zheng He's. That's a, that's allegedly a ocean map map of the world uh, made by Junko. If you look at this map, if you look at this map, it's amazingly accurate. It not only um, not only contains uh, America, North America, South America, right? China, Africa, so right, Eurasia, and it even has Antarctica. So, so this uh, this 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 map was uh, purchased by Mr. Menges in the Chinese antiques market, and and he used this uh, this uh, so-called evidence to show that uh, Zheng He discovered America. Um, a lot of historians, professional historians, all disagree. I mean, in my understanding, all professional historians, no matter they're in the West or in China, everyone say this is not gonna be true, and then and then. Uh, Mr. Menges sent this this map he, he purchased from a Chinese antique market to a lab uh, in New Zealand, I believe, to date to to use a carbon fourteen technology to date the 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 map. And it turned out that the lab test result is that this map is from the fourteenth century. So that makes things even more confusing. Because professional historians, when they look at this, they all say this is impossible. This is impossible for Ch Chinese to know not only America but also to know Antarctica, right? Uh, but but the lab result says that it is it is the 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 the, the map is from uh, the fifteenth century. So later, further study have shown that it turned out that this is a very smartly faked map because the fakers. They used the real paper from the 15th century, but they used modern ink to fake this piece, this uh, this map. And and Mr. Menges just purchased this uh, this map, and he believed that really the Chinese <laughs> discovered America. So this is uh, yeah. There, there are a lot of problems with this, with this map. I, years years ago, I remember I I watched this um, this documentary movie from the history in History Channel in the. Uh, many China his the China historians are interviewed in the uh, in the documentary, and uh, all of them are you know are, are are questioning the authenticity of this map. For example, a lot of the place names used in this map are modern place names. They cannot they couldn't have been used in in the Ming Dynasty. So that's a linguistic uh, sort of a criticism, linguistic criticism of uh, of this map of this map. Um, another story about about Zheng He is that uh, when when Chinese government is sort of is, is is initiating the one road one belt project, they they try to fund uh, these countries that Zheng He visited uh, and welcome them to study Chinese culture uh, and Chinese language in China, uh, and then. A couple of years ago, I believe it was 2005, a Kenyan girl uh, sent a letter to Chinese embassy in Kenya, in East Africa. And she claims that she is a descendant of a Zheng He's a seaman who had a, a shipwreck or accident in, in, in Kenya. He says, hundreds of years ago, my ancestors, they're from China. They, they had this, uh, this accident. Uh, in in Kenya, they lost their ship. So hundreds of them just settled 
in Kenya, uh, and and they, and they 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 settled there. Uh, they they maintained their Chinese tradition. Uh, their their skin color is 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 pale, uh, lighter, and the traditions and customs are different from other local people. And I am a descendant of those Chinese who arrived in Kenya. Um, and, and, and I'm a descendant of a Zheng Hu's seaman. But if you look at this, this girl, she, she looks purely just like a Kenyan African girl. So there is no biological trace that shows that she's a Chinese, but, but she constantly writes to Chinese embassy year after year, okay? Until one day he received a scholarship from Chinese government saying, okay, we trust, we believe your story. Here's the money. You're welcome to study Chinese language and culture to China. So she got a like four year scholarship of going to China, all paid by the Chinese government. So there's a funny story about, um, about the legacy of Zheng He's voyages uh, in 21st century, in 21st century. Uh, all right, so now let's, let's have a, a break. And then we will have we will meet again at uh, say uh, six oh five. All right, I will see you at six oh five.